Chapter 13 Breakup May came in with perfect weather, and people began to anticipate an early breakup. It was the custom to hold a sweepstake annually on the exact moment when the river ice moved. Pete predicted that this would happen about the last day in May. The point of reckoning was from a line across the river opposite the Hudson's Bay Company store. An apparatus had been fixed up which at the first movement of the ice would ring an alarm bell and the moment would be re recorded. The person who had made the nearest estimate would be awarded the prize money. There were now long hours of glorious sunshine and on May 1st the shade temperature was 55 degrees. During the day the water from the thawing snow filled the deep ditches which ran down towards the river. When the temperature dropped the culverts would be blocked with great lumps of ice which pushed the snow water to overflow in floods on the lower lying ground. The river ice was patched with lakes. This did not indicate that the ice was melting, merely the snow on top of it. The ice itself was still strong enough to support the little red plain which sat out away from the bank surrounded by top water. The thaw further up river brought tons of extra water into the Peel Channel and in midstream the ice was being forced up by the weight of water underneath. Every night from CHAK urgent messages were broadcast about the condition of the ice. I was thrilled to see the naked earth again though it was as black as Indian ink and as sticky as treckle. Embroidered mucklucks had now been replaced by rubber boots. Even the Eskimos with their waterproof whale skin high boots had taken to goulashes. The schoolboys were in heaven. <clears throat> the buildings were surrounded by stretches of water about knee-deep and lined with thick mud. On which fleets of miniature boats maneuvered through all the play hours. The bigger boys constructed rafts out of planks and empty oil drums and liked to lure a lightly shod girl onto the raft, they would pull her out into the middle of the expanse and then walk away and leave her marooned. The supervisors became resigned to the cry. Mary sat down in the mud and after, say, the second change of clothing in one day, they would say, all right, Mary, take your wet things off and hang them on the radiators. You'll have to go to bed until they are dry. Pete announced one day that the RCMP constable would be leaving at dinner time that day on his way to Herschel Island in the Beaufort Sea, where the police dogs would spend the summer. So I went to watch them set off. There were two teams totaling 26 dogs, 13 pulling each loaded toboggan. The native guide drove the leading sledge and a Mountie the second one, not resplendent in the scarlet uniform, of course, but appropriately clad in furs. <clears throat> In the grounds of the RCMP 
barracks, the dogs strained to start the sledges, then leapt off with tails erect to plow through the pitch-black mud and knee-deep stretches of water to the river bank. They would travel for over a hundred miles on frozen river and sea. Although the driver carries a dog whip, a long-lashed, short-handled whip, he has to be able to control the team chiefly by his voice. When he calls, G, the dogs veer to the right. At Ha, they change direction to the left. When he roars something indistinguishable, they stop dead and then turn to see what he wants. If a young dog gets tangled up in the harness, the driver jumps off the back of the sled, sprints ahead, and often without stopping the team, tipples the casualty right over to get him between the traces again. The dogs, which have momentarily slowed up, leap off again, and a man has to be pretty agile to be able to grab the handles and leap aboard as the sledge whizzes past. The dogs were not the only sufferers from the mud. Mothers waded through it, followed by unrecognizable infants plastered from head to foot. They were very long-suffering and did not scold the children. Sometimes in crossing the road, a child would, would get stuck and lift his voice in a frightened howl until a passerby strode across to lift him out of his boots and deposit him on the wooden sidewalk or a young woman all dressed up to go out visiting would inadvertently step out of her rubber boot and plunge her silk stockinged leg into the black porridge of the mud. The problem now occupying my mind was how was I to be accommodated when I transferred to the day school? The district administrator had recommended to Ottawa that a principal's house should be built next to the school, but Gloria said she had no inclination to move from her cozy apartment in the center of town. She liked to be among people and said she would be scared to live by herself on the edge of the settlement. Finally, she suggested that I should occupy the house, and I considered myself lucky to be offered the chance of having a whole house to myself in an Arctic settlement, where the allotting of accommodation tends to be the cause of a permanent headache for the authorities. In Oklavik, it is not possible to buy a plot of land and build your own house. The land belongs to the government, and houses for government officials and civil servants are built by the government and allotted by the district administrator. The snag is that a house built for a bachelor game warden or a spinster schoolmistress may be hopelessly inadequate for their successor if he turns out to be a married man with wife and family accompanying him. If I was going to be living alone, after the midsummer break, I should have to do my own cooking and catering. It was time I got busy on the ordering of supplies. The last plane before breakup was going out in a couple of days' time, and my order must be on it. I tore my hair as I tried to work out the quantities I should require. How many packets of cereal, for instance, does one consume in a year? How many tins of soup? How many needles? How many dish mops? Having worked myself into a frenzy, I at last consulted the district administrator, who gave me a letter of reference to a wholesale firm in Edmonton 
so that I should not need to enclose cash with the order and a catalog of suggested foodstuffs. I was still in a quandary. There were no prices listed and no weights, but I had to get the supplies somehow, and so I plumped for such items as two tens of dehydrated onions. One must have onions, a carton of toilet rolls, a box of scouring powder, and at last my order was complete. Throughout May we watched the river. The shore ice melted long before the main body of the ice, leaving a channel of water bordering the river bank. The people who had to come to town from the far side of the river would leave their toboggan on the ice and hail a friend with a canoe to come and ferry them to the bank. The dogs lying on the ice beside the sled waited patiently for their master's return. The businessmen in town, finding the suspension of the mail service during this period very irksome, had sent a signal to Ottawa demanding that mail should be brought in on a chartered plane, which was coming to Oklavik from Alaska to fetch furs. This would be a land plane with wheels, and it was expected that it would land on a patch of comparatively smooth ground in front of the Anglican Mission buildings, where small planes had sometimes landed in previous summers. The plane was due to arrive on a Tuesday, but on the Sunday and Monday there was a blizzard, and the snowfall dimmed our hopes. However, Pete announced at dinner time that the plane was on the way. The staff kept their ears pricked all through the afternoon, but in vain, and at supper time we gave Pete a piece of our mind. He insisted that the pilot had left Norman Wells on the last lap of the flight, but as the storm had continued and he had no experience of landing in Oklavik in winter conditions, he had to turn round and fly right back to Edmonton. A few days later, Pete came in at lunchtime with the promise of a delivery of mail that day. His remarks were greeted with a howl of derision, and so he refused to say a word more. Dinner was over, and the children were going into the playrooms when the hum of an engine was heard in the distance. With a yell of plane, we all struggled into our parkas and ran out into the schoolyard. A big, unfamiliar plane was circling slowly overhead, gradually losing height. The children were called off the landing ground, and we all held our breath, waiting to see it land. But the plane passed over very low without attempting a landing. It made off again towards the mountains, almost out of sight, circled, and then came silently swooping across the river towards the town. Suddenly, there was an amplified ah from hundreds of throats. Four bombs were sailing down, right on top of the little post office building. The bombs were bags of mail, and it turned out that the only mishap to the contents was the breaking of a set of dentures the plane was on military maneuvers of some sort and had detoured to make this much appreciated gesture of goodwill towards the settlement. The ice heaved on the 29th of May when a crack right across the river rifted into a channel of blue water 
and in no time the little red canoes, motor-powered, were zooming back and forth. Some of us went for a walk along the river bank, round midnight. It was difficult to settle to sleep these days when the sun blazed throughout the twenty-four hours. It was a lovely night. The water near the shore and in the rifted channel was absolutely still, dyed pink and purple and orange, with deep reflections in it. The newly painted schooners and motor boats on the shore added scarlet and green and dazzling white to the picture. We walked upstream along the earth road until it ended in bush. The moving ice had brought down huge chunks and thrown them up onto the road, gouging out the bank. One lump about eight feet high was balanced on edge, so we heaved it until it went over into the water with such a splash that it brought the father running out of the Roman Catholic mission. As the ice blocks rocked against each other, there was a chain of musical tinklings that lasted for seconds. In school during the daytime, the children's attention strayed constantly to the windows, and there were several false alarms. Someone would see a little iceberg go floating downstream and shout out, The ice is moving. But it was after supper on June 1st that it actually happened. I had expected breakup to be heralded by a roar or a series of explosions, but this display was quite unspectacular. I climbed up to the flat roof of the school for a better view and saw that the whole river was moving very slowly. Looking to the right across the town site, I followed the course of the river as far upstream as the RC mission. Here the ice had already gone, and a big white boat was in the water. Before I had recovered from my amazement at seeing the masts of this Hudson's Bay Company boat, I heard the hum of an engine and looked up to see a plane. We were in touch with civilization once more. In half an hour's time, there was no sign of ice, and blue water stretched from shore to shore. The next excitement was to be the arrival of the banana boat, bearing stores for the Hudson's Bay Company. The white-masted boat had gone out to escort her. We all hurried through our duties and went out to join the crowd, waiting to welcome the boat. The waters of the swollen river were now almost level with the top of the bank, and the current was flowing so swiftly that the boat was swept downstream at a great rate. But the captain knew his job and swung his craft across the river to land opposite the very doors of the store. Planks were laid down, and the people on the bank watched, with their mouths watering while the stores were wheeled in. Crate after crate of oranges, apples, grapefruits, tomatoes, onions, lemons, potatoes, and eggs. Bottles and bottles of pop. The white people who knew that the price for this outside was seven cents a bottle <clears throat> could not bring themselves to pay the forty cents demanded. But the natives, with pockets full of money, from the sale of their muskrat pelts, bought bottles for all the family. The store was open till after midnight. The next day, mail arrived, 34 bags of it. It had been accumulating in Norman Wells since April. Immediately, the river ice had gone. There was a miraculous change. The bare branches of the willow bushes were clouded with green overnight and whereas for months <clears throat> no birds except the black ravens and white ptarmigan had been seen, with latterly the little 
snow hunting, the willows were now seething with bird life. The puddles were thronged with snipe and sandpipers, swallows and house martins, pine grosbeaks and American robins, yellow birds like canaries, and others that I could not identify, trialed and twittered in the bushes. Ducks, loons, and seagulls in hundreds flocked on the marsh. Geese and swans passed overhead, honking, squawking at a great height. The shallow pools were swarming with millions of whip-tailed grubs that I mistook at first for tadpoles. The wading birds gorged themselves on these in the damp places between the scattered homes. Golden patches of marsh marigolds spilled from puddle to puddle, and in wet woodland in the mission grounds I found masses of a little white flower called pyrola that looked like lily of the valley but had no scent. I gathered some of these and took them in triumphantly for table decoration. It was a joy to be able to go out and pick wild flowers again, and in the second week of June I asked if I might take the children for a nature walk. They would have to take me, in truth, since I did not know the countryside, but there would surely be some subject of interest to justify the walk. We splashed through bog and crashed through bushes, and I tried anxiously to keep the school buildings within my line of vision, so that I would know which way to head when we returned. The children brought handfuls of cranberries for me to eat. These were the fruits of the previous year, which had been pre preserved under the snow. The boys soon found treasure in the form of of the nest of an arctic owl on the ground with eight eggs in it. As they stooped to look at it, the bird watched them from the bare branches of a neighboring tree. Further on, on the shore of a little lake close up to the settlement, we found a loon's nest with three eggs in it. Spring was bursting out all over. Chapter 14 Arctic summer. Summer in Oklavik was heralded by the procession upstream of the returning Eskimo houseboats with their dog teams tethered to the decks and rows of muskrat carcasses hanging from the rails to make dry meat and by the mushroom growth of clusters of white tents all along the river bank and across bordering the Pokiak Channel. The ratting season closed on June 15th, and the Eskimos came to town with their families to sell their furs and make merry through the long summer days and nights. Soon there were several hundred dogs staked among the willows. The children in school were not worried about their end-of-the-year examinations. On the daily walk, now they could look forward to meeting their friends and relations as they went through the town, and in the play hours they lined up on the edge of the water to watch for their own family boat coming in. Mr. Gibson and Pete were busy all day painting the mission boat and getting it ready for the water term ended on Wednesday 27th of June, and that evening the children from MacPherson boarded the mission boat for their trip home. All night they would travel up the Peel Channel in the golden sunlight, the chug-chug of their engine breaking into the lonely silence of the Arctic. My own pupils were very anxious for me to accompany them, so that they could introduce me to the beauties of their much-loved MacPherson, but seeing the forty children disporting themselves on the narrow edge of deck around the boat, 
I was thankful for my peace of mind that I remained behind. I did not realize that these children were as much at home on a boat as an English child is on a bicycle. It was not long before the children were dispersed, those husky girls and boys whose families had come to town were as near their homes as were the Indians who resided in the town, but there were some whose homes were, far, were too far away at Copper Mine or Perry River, and they would have to spend the vacation also at school, so supervision duties were not ended, and as most of those left behind were little children who were not accustomed to helping with the domestic chores. The staff were also kept busy on such themselves. July 1st, Dominion Day, fell on a Sunday, so the occasion was celebrated on the Friday beforehand. The fair ground was a stretch of the river bank, and for a few days beforehand, the men of the settlement were busy putting up booze and stalls and the women making cakes and cookies and root beer for sale. On the day itself, a sunny, windy day, with great tufts of white cloud blowing about the deep blue sky, though there were no roundabouts to add festivity. There were plenty of sideshows, and business was brisk. I was helping at the fish pond. A child paid 25 cents and dropped his fishing line over a screen behind which my perspiring assistant fixed a package on his hook for him to haul up. I discreetly murmured through the canvas the sex and approximate age of the customer so that a present could be selected from the appropriate pile. The winners of the events in the children's sports, flat races, skipping races, sack race, three-legged race, were awarded dollars and half dollars as prizes, which most of them spent immediately in the side shows, and my stall took one hundred and thirty dollars in a couple of hours. The last item of the town sports was a tug-of-war for the grown-ups, in view of the prevalence of tuberculosis among the native population, I expected their men to be of poor physique, but the Huskies won both their events against the white people. The women's team pulled the white women over the line in a few seconds. Their men had a harder struggle against a team of the Royal Canadian Navy, but they won in the end, and everybody cheered. In the evening, there was a softball match on the river bank, but the players spent more time swatting mosquitoes than batting the ball. Then the grown-ups went home to prepare for the dance, which was to be held in the native hall. All night long, while the sun climbed the northern sky towards the east, the air vibrated with the soft drumming of moccasined feet and the shrill rhythm of the fiddler's reels and jigs accompanying the square dances. When the dancers were at last exhausted, the members of the orchestra mopped the sweat from their brows and gave place to the amplifier on the record player. Then through the open windows poured the wail of popular tunes, and the couples shuffled round the floor in the modern style. All night long, the children played around outside the hall, and the procession of happy people passed backwards and forwards between the dance hall and the river bank. As I was leaving the mission at the end of August, 
having completed only one year of service, I was not entitled to any holiday. I could not even go away for the weekend. It was the same for all the white women in the town. There was no holiday resort within thousands of miles. Those whose husbands had the use of canoes did perhaps get an occasional opportunity of going on an excursion, but at the mission the women on the staff were not permitted to go out unescorted, owing to the danger of getting lost. If they landed to explore the country and lost their way in the bush, a search party would have a difficult time finding them, and they might die of exhaustion from the attacks of the mosquitoes before being rescued. There was also the danger of an encounter with a bear at this time of the year. I was very sorry for the young white mothers in the town. They had had so much to put up with, the extreme cold and the darkness of the winter, when young children must necessarily be kept indoors. Then the irritation due to the thaw, when they were washing muddy clothing half the day, and now the menace of the mosquitoes, when babies' prams had to be enveloped in muslin and toddlers must wear long-legged pants with the ends tucked into rubber boots. The men had their duck shooting trips, but there was no change of scene at all to restore the morale of the women before the coming of the next winter. If, for instance, there had been a river steamer cruising back and forth between Oklavik and the Arctic coast, it would have been booked to capacity by nurses and teachers and the wives of military personnel grateful for a chance to throw off their responsibilities temporarily and to see something of this North Country. The recently appointed medical officer in the town was a Dane named Dr. Christensen, who, after a life spent ministering to the Eskimos in Greenland, had come to Canada to tend and study the Western Eskimo. I had chatted to him during the Sunday evening social gatherings, and he must have sensed the frustration I felt in leading such a circumscribed life. The upshot was that I received an invitation to accompany his wildlife service expedition the following Sunday to make a collection of wild flowers with the cooperation of the rest of the staff. I was able to arrange to have that Sunday as my off-duty day, and I looked forward all the week to the adventure. Pete warned me not to wear a short-sleeved blouse or summer dress for the outing, but to see that every inch of flesh possible was covered from the mosquitoes. So I wore a long-sleeved blouse and pushed the legs of my slacks into Wellington boots. We set off in two little kicker canoes, painted bright red, immediately after dinner, heading towards the distant mountain range, which could be seen from my bedroom window. My first thrill came when we returned, turned into a channel bordered by banks, which were clothed in lush emerald green. It seemed years since I had seen green grass. I begged the boys to take me close to it. One of them said, You know, I think you're going to be disappointed. And I was. What I had mistaken for grass was a profusion of equestum 
mare's tails, the sort of plant that I had seen at home growing on railway embankments. We turned into midstream again and cruised along through water as calm as gelatin along placid waterways framed in that brilliant green. We came to a fork in the channel and turned to the right. Then another exclamation burst from my lips. The top of the river bank was lined with ranks of blue lupins, backed by the green of the willows and the spruce trees, marching into the distance. I must have some, I exclaimed, imagining bowls of lupins adorning window sills and staircase nooks at the mission. So the boys obligingly turned the canoe towards the shore again, and when they touched the land, I leapt out and scrambled up the bank. Before I could take more than one handful, the winged hordes were upon me with Flailing arms, I tried to keep them at bay, but they zoomed down on my face and neck and hands in millions until yelling, I ran for the canoe. We sped for the middle of the river, the clouds of insects following us until we were once more in midstream. The doctor in the leading canoe was rugged enough to persist in his flower gathering in spite of the mosquitoes, and he found fifteen different species in bloom. The next excitement concerned the arrival of the freight from outside on the Mackenzie River boat, which had to make the two thousand mile voyage via the Athabasca Lake and the Great Slave Lake. The Hudson's Bay Company banana boat had been able to arrive much earlier than the Mackenzie River boat because it came by a different route from Fort Nelson on the Alaska Highway and via the Liard River into the Mackenzie. I was told that the Liard had its source in the mountains of the southern Yukon and northern British Columbia, flowing eastwards to join the Mackenzie at Fort Simpson. There were two advantages in using this route. One, that fresh fruit and vegetables for transportation by river steamer could be brought by truck to Fort Nelson, and the other, that the ice in the Yard River broke up in early May, more than a month before the Great Slave Lake was free of ice. In August, however, the depth of water in the Liard was too low for successful navigation. Now that the Mackenzie boat was coming in my trunk, it would be arriving at last. The lumber for the new house would be on board, or so I devoutly hoped. The goods from the mail order stores, from soap flakes to washing machines, outboard engines, refrigerators, and of course the presents for another Christmas. The Northern Transportation Company had developed a slick system of organization to deal with the mountains of freight which had been piling up since the previous September for shipment to the north. It was stored on a number of flat-bottomed barges, each holding about 500 tons of freight, lashed together and propelled by a blunt-nosed, flat-bottomed, diesel-engined tug. The tug and her brood would leave Fort McMurray near waterways early in June and set out along the Athabasca River, smooth and broad and slow-flowing, 
with a slope of eight inches or so to a mile near McMurray, the river banks are 300 feet high, but in the delta area where the river flows into Lake Athabasca, the banks are down to water level, and the water itself is very shallow. If the captain found the depth of water was much reduced, he would have to wait two or three days for it to deepen. Lake Athabasca is about 200 miles long and 35 miles wide at its greatest width. The boats have to go well out into the lake to skirt the shallows due to silting at the western end of the lake, and if the wind is in the east or north, there may be another delay while the captain waits at the river mouth for fair weather. The lake storms can be dangerous to flat-bottomed craft. The exit from the lake is by Rogers River, which meanders to join the Peace River about 30 miles north of the lake. Beyond the confluence with the Peace, the waterway is renamed. It now becomes the Slav River, deep and broad, nearly a mile wide, flowing smoothly to Fort Fitzgerald on the border of the Northwest Territories. At Fitz, there is a hiatus. Here, the waters of the Slave River become turbulent and unnavigable, running into a series of rapids which lowered the level of the river bed by 125 feet and 16 miles. In order to bypass the rapids, all the freight has to be unloaded from the barges and portaged by road in trucks through Fort Smith to Bell Rock, where another tug is waiting with a set of barges. From Bell Rock, the freight is carried down to the Arctic or across Great Slav Lake to the mining settlement of Yellowknife, where the Slave River enters Great Slave Lake. The procession of barges has another delta to nego go negotiate. The current of the Slave is faster than that of the Athabasca and carries less sediment, but the river winds interminably. At one curve, it travels 16 miles to advance half a mile. The lake is larger than Lake Erie or Lake Ontario and is over a thousand feet deep in parts, with scenic attractions that would make it a tourist target if it were more accessible. The numerous islands, peninsulas, and channels are flanked by steep red cliffs reflected in the blue water. The Slave Lake, far from offering a peaceful respite from the hazards of river navigation, presents a more serious menace. The Slave River and the upper waters of the Mackenzie are free of ice in mid-May, but the ice in Great Slave Lake does not finally break up until mid-June. It is this check which holds up the freight for Oklavik. After the beginning of July, the townspeople were all agog for news of the approach of the boat from the south. Pete's rumors and counter-rumors kept us at fever pitch, until at last the word went round, the boat is in. It had berthed alongside the riverbank with a couple of barges, the others containing freight for Kitagazuit and Tukayaktuk for distribution along the Arctic coast, had been left at the fork of the channels to be picked up later. That evening, everybody gathered on shore to watch the crates come rolling down the gangway and pile up 
on the bank, Mr. Gibson and Pete checked the cases of supplies for the school. These were then loaded onto the stone boat and trundled off by the Caterpillar tractor. Then the principal and the matron checked the individual items. The Christmas gifts were whisked away into storage and the huge basement was packed with food stores. Any private person who was expecting a parcel had to go down to the vessel's berth beside the river bank, climb the gangplank onto one of the barges, and find the purser who would consult his list and locate the package. The barges were floating warehouses stacked with heavy stuff such as motor trucks and electric washing machines, as well as the long-awaited dance dresses and Christmas toys. The burning question for me was, has the lumber arrived for the teacherage? And when the purser answered no, I was quite despondent. However, the district administrator thought there was no need to worry. The furniture for the teacherage had come, and the lumber would surely be on the second boat, due in the middle of August. But I have to be in the house by September 1st, I exclaimed. You'll be in it, he said. The site was already chosen, a boggy patch on the edge of the town, just behind the day school. The lumber for the teacherage came on the second and last boat, which arrived in the middle of August, and the construction work began immediately. The house was designed and erected by a firm of specialists in Arctic building, and a team of builders was flown in from Montreal to put it up. It was prefabricated with walls and floor double insulated. That is, there were two layers of air between inner and outer surfaces. The walls were layered also with glass fiber and aluminum foil. The remnants of this which were left out afterwards came in very handy for providing medieval armor for school plays later on. The building went up at great speed, and there was continuous daylight. The men worked in shifts all round the 24 hours. No deep foundations were laid. The floors were just raised from the level of the ground by the use of sills, short legs laid, logs horizontally, with the top surface flattened. In winter, earth was piled all round at the base of the walls for warmth and protection, but as soon as the thaw came, this must be opened up to ventilate the space under the floors. When the shell of the house had been put up, the outside walls and the roof the whole floor was covered with a thick ship's linoleum in dark green, and then the inner walls were inserted. Thus there was no draught under the skirting boards. I had been afraid that the interior decorating might be ordered according to some color scheme with which I could not live happily, so I was pleasantly surprised to receive a visit from the architect who accompanied the building team, and to be invited to choose my own colorings for the walls. He guaranteed to mix the paint to any color I chose. When the little house was completed, I found the color scheme very attractive, with each room a different hue, peach, green, blue, pink, gray, all pastel shades. I christened my new home Candy Cottage. Entering the house by the front door, you passed through a porch, well lit by two windows, directly into the living room. The heater 
burning paraffin was at the far end of this room. On the right of it was the door into the bedroom. The doors in the house were all shorter than the lintels so that the warm air could circulate. On the left of the heater was an archway into a passage with opposite a door into the bathroom on the right, a door into the spare room, and on the left a door into the kitchen. This was a long, narrow room containing a cream-enameled, oil-burning cooking stove, some cupboard accommodation, a sink with taps but no running water, and the ice tank next to the stove. At the far end of the kitchen, a glass-paneled door led into the back porch, which had no windows and was very cold in winter, so that it provided a refrigerator in itself. The furniture was all brand new, of good quality in a modern style. One room remained unfurnished. This was lucky since the second boat had also brought in the grocery stores, which I had ordered from Edmonton, and I could use the empty room as a warehouse. I now discovered the mistakes I had made. I was appalled to find myself saddled with, for instance, two seven pound tins of dehydrated onions, of which I subsequently used about a cupful in a year, 144 toilet rolls, six dozen tins of scouring powder, and so on. The bill amounted to $618, and it took me months to pay it off. Now I could entertain my friends from the mission whenever they could spare time from their multitudinous duties to call and see me. They were envious of my peaceful surroundings. Fancy having all this to yourself, they said. You'll be able to entertain Roger Wilton. He was here the other evening, I replied. Is he in town? asked Vera. I haven't seen him around lately. He's gone up river, river in his boat, I said. I understand he's going outside. Outside, exclaimed Mario. Well, he might have to come to say goodbye. He hates goodbyes, I told her. That was what he had said. I hate goodbyes. We may meet again some day. Roger was gone. Another chapter had closed, but history was being made here, and I felt I was at the heart of it. There was still adventure ahead. Chapter 15 Civil Servant, the Superintendent of Education, who had approved my transfer to the day school, had moved to a higher post, and his successor had not yet been named, but my appointment had been effected on September 1st, and I was now, technically speaking, a civil servant. Teachers appointed to the government schools in remote areas were to be called welfare teachers, and they would serve continuously for two years, not four years, as in the mission, before going on furlough. During these two years, school holiday periods would be parallel with those of city schools, outside as far as the pupils were concerned but the teacher would be required to continue on duty, except on recognized bank holidays, in activities designed to promote the welfare of the people in the settlement, both children and adults, native and white. This, as the government brochure pointed out, was a challenging role, the teacher should have a genuine interest in people, infinite patience, high courage, and unlimited resourcefulness. He or she must first win the confidence of the children and then proceed to develop a good relationship with the older members of the community. It was suggested that the medium for welfare work would be 
a remedial finding ways of meeting individual tragedy or difficulty and be creative serving to strengthen community life remedial work would be concerned with problems arising from want ill health disharmony in family relationships broken homes delinquency and illegitimacy the teacher was advised to seek to eliminate the causes of problems due to ignorance of for example hygiene child training household management and urged not to be easily discouraged the manual went on to list suggested activities of welfare teachers in addition to their professional duties they would be called upon to lend their assistance in connection with such administrative matters as the payment of family allowances the dispensing of medicines the investigation of welfare cases requiring assistance and the supervision of special problem cases and expected to organize recreational programs devise measures of adult education visit the homes and endeavor to improve the living conditions and the general welfare of the people i found this inspiring reading and could hardly wait for september 4th when school was due to begin but it was three weeks before i was in harness the first setback was due to the fact that the newly painted and varnished floors in the day school were not completely dry it had been raining for nearly a week and the mud was as thick as ever then when we were at last ready to open on the morrow the medical officer came round to the school where gloria and i were unpacking new stationery to say that the school must not open for three weeks there was a case of suspected polio in the anglican mission hospital and the town was being put into a strict quarantine there were to be no gatherings of any sort not even in church no movies no sunday school meetings no day school attendance the children at the mission were not even to be allowed to take their daily walk the aim was to keep the entire native people from contact with the whites since they were so susceptible to the white man's diseases no one from the settlement across the river was to come into town except in a case of extreme urgency and no plane would be allowed to fly in the doctors gave orders that all food was to be kept covered and human waste was to be burnt this would not be easy to achieve in view of the damp conditions out of doors dr christensen was away touring by boat round the coast of the remote places in order to check on the health of the eskimos and the medical officer in charge of the two hospitals in okovic was not much more than a boy the previous year there had been an epidemic of polio at fairbanks and alaska across the mountains from okovic when 40 cases developed the townspeople were all very apprehensive luckily their fears were not realized the precautions taken proved effective and school was able to open on september 24th the little day school consisted of one large room the wall at each end of which was taken up by tall windows there was a folding partition across the room dividing it into two classrooms and gloria had ordered a heavy curtain which she had had fixed to hang on my side of the partition to muffle the sounds between the classrooms a corridor ran from end to end of the building alongside the two classrooms at one end of this was the front door and porch and at the other end the back door 
looking onto the teacherage. Across the corridor from the classrooms were storerooms, cloakrooms, and a kitchen with sink and oil-burning stove. My classroom was well filled with 45 children in all age groups from 5 to 15 years. It would have been difficult to cope with this wide age range if they had all been at normal grade level. But since they represented a mere two years range in educational achievement, it was comparatively easy. Some of them had begun school for the first time when the day school had opened the previous year. They should now be at grade two level. The others, including two 15-year-old Eskimo boys, were attending school for the first time and were classed as beginners. Ronald, with his shy smile, did not appear to have much facility with the English language. He spoke very seldom, and so I had to guess whether he had understood what I had said. I soon found out, however, that I needed a different technique in teaching 15-year-olds from that which I had developed with 5- and 6-year-olds. In teaching small children to write, it had always been my practice to guide their hands at first, so that they learnt to make their strokes in the right direction for cursive writing. But when I unthinkingly held Ronald's hand, I got such an unexpected response that I thought I had better change my methods. Gloria had worked very hard during the previous year to implement the suggestions put forward with regard to the duties of a welfare teacher. She had spent many weekends in organizing social events for the teenagers and occasional dances for the adult population. Nobody realized the amount of work she expended on this. There was a school janitor, an Eskimo, but his time was taken up in attending the oil stoves and heaters and disposing of sewage and delivering ice and other such routine matters <clears throat> in all the government buildings in town, and so he was not available for stacking the desks and polishing floors and the other things that a school caretaker outside spends his time doing. Before a dance, Gloria and her pupil volunteers had an arduous time. Then, after the dance, the building had to be put right for school on Monday morning, which meant <clears throat> a Sunday spent in mopping and swabbing and lifting desks, as well as coping with the after-dance squalor in the kitchen, the disposal of pans full of cold coffee grounds and plates of half-eaten sandwiches and cakes. All this was a thankless task, but it was a fine effort to promote the social welfare of the community. It also had a more measurable value. The dances had been so well attended that Gloria had been able from the proceeds of the entrance fees to purchase from a resident the only privately owned piano in town. This was a commendable achievement, and I could understand Gloria's pride in it. For the first week or two of the new school year, she was liable to hail any interested passerby and drag him into school to admire the drapes, the curtains on the partition, and the piano. It did not take me long to discover the flaw in the catalog of activities that should be undertaken by a welfare teacher. The assumption that the teacher would be able to devout, devote his time exclusively to his job. This might be possible when the teacher was a married man with a wife to attend to his home and his domestic needs, but it was a dream as far as we were concerned. <clears throat> when I had spent a Saturday morning, for instance, in a round of home visiting, including the long cold walk across the river and back, I did not come home to find a hot dinner prepared for me. I had to start then to cook my meal from scratch, wait until it was cooked, 
and then wash up the dishes after eating it. There was the possibility of buying a meal of sorts at the hotel, but after the cold weather began, you did not stay out of doors longer or go further than was absolutely necessary. My indoor chores I took a pride in keeping my green linoleum polished and my furniture shining combined with the evening marking and preparation of lessons left me less time than I should have liked to spend on welfare duties. I did not, however, have to struggle with coal carrying or wood chopping. The Eskimo janitor, Johnny Elcock, attended to my heating system and also to my water supply. Every morning he staggered in with a huge block of ice in his arms and tipped it with a crash into the tank next to the kitchen stove. Every noon he brought in a can of oil and filled the tank of the oil heater in the sitting room and that of the cooking stove. At first he had had to fill the tanks twice a day. He did not always come himself as he farmed out his job to visiting Eskimos who stayed in his home. This was a Quonset Nissen hut left over from some army scheme and divided into a number of compartments. As Johnny was one of the few Eskimos resident in the settlement, I supposed he was expected to maintain the traditions of hospitality which applied in the igloo. Apparently his visitors compensated him by performing some of his chores, but when strange men walked into my house at midnight and started clanking about at the heater next to my open bedroom door, I took exception to it. I reported my embarrassment to the, to the district administrator, and he laughed and said he would arrange things differently. So after that, they bought Johnny a double-sized can, and he filled my tanks only once a day. Now that I was living in a house of my own, I found myself responsible for catering as well as cooking. Such provisions as breakfast cereals, dried and canned fruits, tinned and dehydrated vegetables and soups were contained <clears throat> in the cardboard cartons stacked up in my empty room. But I had to find a source of protein. At first I lived on fish. Across the road from my house was the home of a white trapper, George, an Englishman. He had the right to trap here because he had been established as a trapper in the territories before the passing of the game ordinance, which forbade trapping to the white man. One day I crossed the road rather diff diffidently and braved the sled dogs. George's dogs were housed in tea chest kennels and made unexpected sorties, thinking in terms of a fillet of place I asked George if he could provide me with some fish for my Sunday dinner. Certainly, said George, and he went to a barrel. Full to the brim, and took out a frozen fish bigger than anything I had ever seen outside the glass cases in English pub parlors. Good heavens, I exclaimed. What on earth will I do with that? It'll make a jolly good meal, said George. I dare say, I replied. It would make a banquet, but to begin with, I don't know how to prepare it. George found me a smaller fish, and I left it all night in my kitchen to thaw. The next day, Johnny Elcock's daughter dealt with the scaling and cleaning, and I cut off a piece of the succulent white fish for my meal. When I got tired of fish, I set out to buy reindeer meat from the Hudson's Bay Company store in town. I want a small joint of meat for the weekend, I said. You'd better come and choose it. 
said the clerk, and I followed him out of the back door and across to the big warehouse. Here, a trap door in the floor led into the meat store, a chamber excavated from the permafrost in which hung the reindeer carcasses. The man disappeared down the ladder and returned after a moment with the hind quarters of an animal slung across his shoulders. From this, he proceeded to chop off such a large hunk that I protested. He explained that they had not time to deal in small joints. But I can't even carry that, I exclaimed. Someone will lend you a sled, he said. So I hauled my meat home over the snow, conscious of a nagging sense of guilt at having acquired such a big piece, a hangover from the days of meat rationing in England. Oklavik was now marooned again, isolated by the freeze-up, since the little mail plane had gone out to Edmonton to be fitted with skis. Soon the sun would set for the long night, and the children would, would grow pale through the, the months of darkness. So, one sunny noon day, early in November, I told the children that I would take them for a short nature walk at the beginning of afternoon school. A trail had been cut through the bush for the laying of a pipeline to the nearest lake, from which tap water was drawn during the summer months. This started just behind the school and made a convenient route for a walk. It was a lovely sunny day, the temperature six below zero, and the forty-five children were full of life as they plowed along the trail knee-deep in snow. When we reached the lake, the little ones began streaming over it, making patterns with their tracks. The bigger boys spotted ptarmigan in the distance and set off to stalk them. The ten-year-olds went off to climb trees, or play hide-and-seek, or came to chase the football which I had taken with us. It did not occur to them to kick in competition against each other. After a time, one of the girls came to me and said, There's a big gray dog in the bushes. This was odd. All dogs in the settlement had to be kept tied to stakes, and in any case, what was a loose dog doing out here? Luckily, for my peace of mind, it never occurred to me that the animal might not be a dog. However, knowing how dangerous roaming dogs could be, I called the children together, and as the sun had now disappeared, we made our way back to school. A few days later, Erica, one of my pupils, whose family lived about a mile from the school in the direction of the lake, came to my school and announced, My daddy shot a wolf. I assumed that he had had an adventure on the trap line and invited her to tell the class about it. It turned out that the shooting had taken place in their backyard. Last night after school, she began, our dogs started to make a row, and my sister, Gret, went out with a flashlight to see what was the matter. Gret had swung the light of her torch round behind the outhouse and found herself gazing into the green eyes of a tall timber wolf. She backed into the house and told her dad that there was a wolf in the yard. He laughed and said she was seeing visions, but as the barking of the dogs continued, he picked up his gun and went out with a torch himself. Then he found it was indeed a wolf and no wandering dog. Holding the torch, he shot one-handed and killed it. It was not long before his wife was busy making a wolf trim for her parka hood and a handsome pair of trapper's mitts. The government mammologist 
who had an office in the administration block was on the spot at once. For some time, trappers coming into town had been reporting strange behavior among the wild animals in the bush, and it was certainly unusual for a wolf to come right into the settlement in this way. So the mammologist called for the carcass of the animal and sent the head out on the next plane for special analysis. In a few days, a signal came back. The wolf had rabies. Serum was flown in, and all the dogs in town were inoculated, for with radio warnings were sent out from CHAK to the men at their winter camps. If a dog was to bite a human, being the victim must be brought into hospital at once. The dog shot and the brain sent for analysis. An epidemic of rabies among the dogs would prove a major disaster. Dogs spell the difference between life and death to a family in isolated surroundings. The children who came to school from across the river told of encounters with foxes that leapt about madly or spun round and round, and I was quite worried on their behalf. One morning, when the children were writing compositions, I was standing at the blackboard, putting up the spellings. They requested, Eskimo Jean asked, How do you spell Gracie? I wrote the word on the board and said, Remember the capital letter, it is a proper noun. Jean sat with her pen suspended, looking puzzled. I repeated, Gracie is somebody's name. You must begin it with a capital letter. Then seeing Jean still did not understand, I said, read me your sentence. I saw Gracie Fox on the river, said Jean. Who is Gracie Fox, I asked. By this time, several faces were raised towards me, and they all looked puzzled. Then Eskimo Dan at the back of the room murmured, Gracie Wolf, Gracie Fox, and enlightenment dawned on me. Oh, I exclaimed, you mean crazy. I had noticed before this that the Eskimos had difficulty in distinguishing between the breathed and voiced form of a sound. For instance, K and G were indistinguishable to them, as were P and B, T and D. The word pack phonetically was to them the same as bag, ten the same as den, and so on. Hence, crazy became gracie. I was becoming increasingly fond of these children of the Arctic, and they were now much more responsive in their relationship with me. One day, I had been running across a plank bridge over a ditch near the store, carrying a tin of canned fruit under my arm. Suddenly, I slipped and fell heavily into the ditch below, bruising my side on the edge of the can. I hobbled home, but was advised to go for an x-ray to see if I had any broken ribs. When I returned to school, the children came running from all sides, taking my hands and asking with a wealth of sympathy in their voices, you go to have an x-ray. An x-ray at the hospital meant only one thing to them, suspicion of TB. They were very pleasant children to teach. In my opinion, their intellectual capacity was quite comparable with that of the white child, though their achievement did not rank so high, for the simple reason that most of them had had a late start in schooling, and many had spent important years in hospital. When I comment commented on the docility of the children compared with that of some children in civilization. 
I was surprised to be told that that was due to the fact that the native people recognized the supremacy of the white race. This gave me food for thought. What constituted this supposed supremacy? My own conclusion had been that many of the white men in the North were insufficiently aware of the responsibility of their own example. Certainly, some of them came there with the tacit assumption that in a place so far away from civilization, conventions could be relaxed. The public behavior of the native people, too, was more dignified than was that of some of the white people. I could suggest another explanation for the good behavior of the children. The sole source of education in the Northwest Territories for the past two generations had been the Christian Church. In the missions, the children had had not only Christian teaching, but also Christian example. This had surely had its effect. It was because I recognized this spirit in the school, though I could not at the time have defined it, that I began to contemplate the possibility of producing a nativity play at Christmas time, when I went to discuss the idea with Gloria. I found her interested, but not very enthusiastic. She thought the task was beyond us. I decided to embark on it. The children in the day school were less reticent than the mission children because their homes were on the town site and they were accustomed to the society of white people. And I thought that if we did our casting carefully, we might be able to make a success of it. I had the script of a simple play, and I proposed to link the scenes by the singing of carols. A fellow passenger on my trip across the Atlantic had sent me a copy of the Oxford Book of Carols. I taught my own class some of these, and rehearsed some of the children in the spoken parts for a few days. And then I asked Gloria if she would like to see how we were getting on. We folded back the partition between the two rooms, and acted the first scene or two, and from that moment Gloria was thrilled. I had expected to act the little play from the floor of the school, but Gloria had ideas about staging. She prevailed upon the district administrator to provide lumber for a stage, and the manager of the Electric Power Commission in town to improvise footlights and spotlights. She fixed pulleys and wires and rigged up curtains, the precious drapes, and she put up the wine-colored satin curtains from the big windows as a back cloth. The part of Mary was to be taken by Gret, a tall, dark-haired girl, with soft voice and gentle manner. Her mother was an Indian from the Great Slave River area, and I knew sometimes felt like an outcast in this alien northern setting. I had a length of blue material which was intended for a dress. Gret's mother was clever enough to make this into a cloak without cutting it, so that I could still use it for a dress later on if necessary. Mary was attended by four, four pairs of little angels, and I thought their costume would present a problem, but I was able to buy some cheap white cotton material from the bay, and after I had drawn my idea of the long tunic on paper, two of the older girls borrowed a sewing machine and shut themselves into one of the storerooms. Here they measured each little angel, cut out the garment, and stitched it up without assistance from us. With these simple white gowns, 
the angels wore silver circlets on their heads and silver girdles made from the surplus building material, and they each carried a long candle made from twisted sheet of typing paper with a golden tinfoil flame. The shepherds were easy to dress with colored blankets and Arab-style white head scarves, and the kings with blankets and crowns. All the children who were not in the play itself sat in the choir on the floor in front of the stage on each side of the center steps facing the audience. Gloria had had the idea of using the odd bits of material left over from the angel's robes to make shoulder capes for these choristers, giving a sort of surplus effect. My chief concern was with the question of how the children were to be heard. I remembered only too vividly the frustrations of the previous year, when dialogue was drowned by the noise from the audience. I suggested that we should invite all the children in town to the dress rehearsal on the day before the actual performance, and leave the evening show for the adults. As it turned out, this worked very well. On the day of the performance, the school was closed until evening. I got up early and pressed every garment. When I went to call on Gloria, assuming that there would be a final rehearsal of the principals, I found her resting in bed, so I went round in person to all the homes, both in the town and across the river, and called a rehearsal for the afternoon. After this, some of the older boys helped me to cover the rough boards of the stage with heavy packing paper, nailing it down. By that time, it was six o'clock, but I had no time to prepare a meal. I snatched a dish of cornflakes and ate standing up. By seven o'clock, the hall was packed. The cast were in their places. I was at the piano below and to the left of the stage, and Gloria, as prompter, occupied the center seat in the front row. The All Saints mission staff were in the audience in force. Mr. Gibson told me afterwards that when he saw the two teachers out in front and realized that the whole cast was in the wings, he anticipated chaos behind the scenes. His fears did not materialize. The play began with a prologue addressed to the audience. This was to be spoken by a really beautiful Indian boy named Lazarus, about 12 years old, who came from the Pokiak settlement across the river. At all rehearsals, he had spoken... his lines without faltering, but now he took one look at the expectant audience and immediately retreated behind the curtain. Gloria and I exchanged apprehensive glances. There was a momentary pause, then one of the older girls in the cast stepped through the curtains, holding a paper in her hand, and read the prologue. The curtains opened slowly. As the play progressed, the audience became deeply moved. The children seemed to be living their parts, rather than acting them. When little Jenny, kneeling beside the crib, looked up at Mary and said, Is it true that he came from heaven? And Mary replied gravely, Yes, he is God's own son. Our hearts were pierced. There was complete silence in the audience throughout the play, and by the time it was over, many of the grown-ups could not speak. Mr. Gibson went over to the stage, 
where the children were still kneeling in the final tableau, and he talked to them. Others gathered round Gloria and said the experience had been wonderful, perfect, the singing unearthly. I knew that our success had been largely due to the foundation laid by the teaching of the missionaries. The immediate reaction to the success of the play was the suggestion that we should broadcast it from CHAK for the benefit of the hospital patients on Christmas Eve. This involved great difficulties. The big piano had to be manhandled out of the school onto the stone boat and dragged about half a mile to the broadcasting studio. Here there was a plank bridge deep with frozen snow to negotiate over a roadside ditch. The men heaved and struggled in the darkness and at last got the piano safely across. It was very cold inside the hut as the fire had not been lit early enough. My fingers nearly froze to the keys. The performers thought their effort was poor, with the speakers crowding round the microphone while Gloria tried to describe the scene as it had been in the school, but we were told afterwards that it gave the patients much pleasure. This year I was able to enjoy the Christmas entertainment at the All Saints School as a visitor. Again, the Indians and Eskimos were there in crowds, and the traditional hospitality was offered to them. I also had the privilege of attending the entertainment in the Roman Catholic Mission, which was delightfully presented. There was a very lively play involving a surgical mistake, and then a concert by a packed choir and orchestra of little performers with percussion band instruments. Their conductor was a miniature four-year-old in tails and tuxedo, complete with carnation in buttonhole, and a light baton, which he wielded with surprisingly realistic effect. The gray nun who had trained the group stood half hidden in the wings. The little conductor would look to her for approval after each item, and at a nod of her head would turn to the audience and bow stiffly again and again to acknowledge the applause. I was invited for Christmas dinner to my friends across the road. Margaret was a Canadian girl who had adventurously come north in response to an advertisement for a cook in Peffer's Hotel in Oklavik. This was no plush carpeted, palm potted resort of the leisured, but a wooden frame structure catering for those rugged individuals who pass through the north on their own affairs and for those natives who have enough money at supper time to buy reindeer steaks or white fish fillets with apple pie and ice cream. There was no liquor obtainable in the hotel. Intoxicants in Canada can only be bought at a government liquor store, and as there was none such in Oklavik, orders had to be sent outside and the cases brought in by plane. After this, the trappers and prospectors would carouse in their hotel rooms, and the rattling of the poker chips could almost be heard through the matchboard walls. In summertime, when the settlement was full of government construction workers, the hotel rooms would be filled to capacity, and Margaret would spend long days till late at night baking and frying and grilling. She loved nothing better than feeding people and Christmas Day. 
was the occasion for her and her husband to invite to the feast any unattached individuals who might seem likely to spend a lonely day. Their comfortable little house had been built by George himself and consisted of a kitchen, sitting room, and two bedrooms. The back door opened into a porch where a curtained recess hid the bath and then into the kitchen through which you walked into a sitting room a doorway on the right out of the kitchen opened into the boys bedroom with two double tiered bunks and in the sitting room a door opened into the parents bedroom the front door led into a porch where Margaret kept her electric washing machine, <clears throat> the ice providing a water supply, was piled outside the front door, so everything was very snug and compact. On Christmas night, I was the only woman guest, but there were three men, one the part Indian guide to the Mounties, one a prospector and trapper, and the other a fur trader. The dinner was a real Christmas feast. Margaret, now cook for the RCMP, had been allotted her share of their Christmas rations, specially flown in. This included turkey with all the trimmings, cranberry jelly, bread sauce, dressing with potatoes and peas, followed by plum pudding and Christmas cake. For dessert, <clears throat> there were apples and oranges, nuts and candies, and even grapes. After the washing up, the company sat and talked until midnight. I listened with my eyes goggling and my ears pinned back to this man talk about gold and tungsten strikes and fur quality and adventures while hunting. Adolf told with some diffidence about a recent adventure with a bear. He had had many, <clears throat> many encounters with bears, including the big mountain grizzlies of northern British Columbia, and he had known for years that the first rule in bear hunting is never turn your back on a bear den. On one occasion, when he overlooked this rule, he nearly lost his life. The adventure happened towards the spring of the year, when Adolphe was living on the bank of the Anderson River, which flows into the Arctic Ocean. A couple of young native boys came over to his cabin one day to borrow dog feed, and, as his own supply was running low, he decided to spend a day hunting bear to provide meat for the dogs. He set out on foot and soon came upon a bear den. The snow was trampled for a few yards around it, so he knew the bear had already been out. <clears throat> he listened and heard grunts inside, so he shot three times into the den. One of the shots went home, and a bear came stumbling out. Adolf saw that the shot had just grazed his hind ham, so he gave him another one quickly in the head, and the bear fell dead. The grunts continued. There was evidently another bear inside. He fired two more shots without result, then got a long pole and thrust it into the den trying to make contact with the bear. Still, the animal did not come out, so Adolf decided that the only thing to do was to smoke him out. This would involve a trip back to his cabin for oily rags, which he could light and throw into the den. His worry was that while he was away, the bear inside would come out and drag his dead companion in again and he wanted to save the carcass if possible, not only for the dog meat, 
but also for the sake of the hide. He must roll the body further from the den entrance and down the slope of the hill. With his rifle in his left hand, he stooped to roll it over. When he stood up, his back was towards the bare den. The next second he heard a rustle behind him and spun round, but it was too late. The bear from inside the den was on its hind legs, and with its upraised front paw it gave him a cuff on the shoulder, which knocked him for yards. He landed on his back in the snow, but before he could struggle up the bear was straddling over him. It struck at him with unsheathed claws, lacerating his legs. With his left hand, Adolf shoved the muzzle of his rifle into the bear's belly and pressed the trigger. The rifle would not fire. The bear's teeth were clashing above him, and he was fighting to keep them from his throat, while at the same time fumbling to find out what was wrong with the Winchester. At last he found that the lever had flown open in the struggle. He was able to adjust this and fired. At the sound of the explosion, the bear jumped back and made off into the bush. Adolf said he had not yet had time to feel fear. His chief emotion was rage, and when he saw the bear galloping off into the willows, he exclaimed, No bear is damn well going to take a poke at me and get away with it. He made his way back to the cabin, and the boys dressed his wounds and they decided that the following morning they would pursue the wounded bear and make an end of him. The next day the three of them set out. The two boys fetched in the carcass of the dead bear, while Adolf followed his enemy. On the way he came across two more bears and wounded them. He went back for the dog team, and they tracked and killed both of these bears and packed the meat home as Adolf now had enough bear meat. To last till open water, he reluctantly abandoned the pursuit of the bear that had tried to kill him. My senses were still reeling from the thrill of this story when George began to reminisce. A year or two ago, said George, I was trapping muskrats in the spring after the snow had gone. The ice was still firm, and I was traveling by dog team. While I was working on one of the lakes, I saw a cub bear on the bank, standing up and tearing the bark off a cottonwood tree. I always carry a twenty two rifle at this time of year, and so thinking it would be easy game, I took my rifle off the sled and walked quietly towards the cub. I shot, but the shot only made him howl and did not appear to have touched a vital spot. The cub sat down to scratch his wound, and my magazine being empty, I started to reload. Then suddenly I heard a crashing sound, and there through the willows I saw Mama Bear plowing towards me on her hind legs, the branches breaking away from her shoulders. She looked monstrous. I should say she weighed half a ton. I did not stop to argue, but headed back to the dogs at top speed, swinging my arms and brandishing my rifle as I ran. The dogs saw me coming. Whether they were infected by my panic or saw the bear behind me, I don't know, but they made off at full gallop. There were n numerous holes in the ice, but fear gave my feet wings and I went leaping over them and managed to catch the handlebars of the sled. I grabbed a toggle and pounded the lead dog, and away we went, with the bear at our back. We didn't stop till we reached the portage, and then I was thankful to find that the bear had gone back to her cub. George told this story against himself with a smile. Even a green horn should have known that Mother Bear would not be far from her cub.